Hi everyone, welcome to the Real Estate Tax Tips channel. My name is Cherry Chen, a Chartered Professional Accountant located in Oakville, Ontario, Canada. And I'm on a mission to become the Google Map for hardworking Canadians seeking financial freedom. And today's topic is a very interesting one. It's all being inspired by me getting the opportunity to present to a group of real estate investors a couple weeks ago in Costa Rica. Um, a bunch of real estate investors went there from Canada and with this group of investors, we have been, uh, I did a presentation to them on two topics. The first topic is the tax implication on investing in outside of Canada. And the second topic is about leaving Canada, the tax implication of leaving Canada. So I figure it would be something that everyone could use um, as um, their day-to-day -day knowledge uh, before they plan to leave Canada. So with that, today's presentation is about the tax implication on leaving Canada and moving to a different country. Uh, but before I get started, if you like our video, make sure you give us a thumbs up uh, and hit the subscribe button below so then you can stay on top of the latest tax tips. With that, let's get started. To leave Canada as a tax resident is not as simple as packing up your bag and uh, ship everything, move your whole family to that particular country, especially for those who own multiple assets and multiple asset categories in Canada. Now, before I dive deeper into the tax implication, a couple of things that I do want to clarify for you. First thing first, it's very important to recognize that Having a Canadian citizenship does not always mean that you have to pay Canadian taxes. So as long as you are not a Canadian tax resident, so you can use Canadian passport, uh, travel around the world and call yourself Canadian without paying Canadian uh, taxes. And this is the reason why people are considering becoming a Canadian non-tax resident. For the purpose of our discussion here, we're only referring to converting yourself from a Canadian tax resident to a, Cana to a Canadian non-tax resident. If you live in Canada, majority of the year, you will be considered a Canadian tax resident. Uh, if you own a home in Canada, you uh, drive a car in Canada, you have spouse that lives in Canada, you have dependent that lives in Canada, those are factors that people would decide that you are, the, the law would conclude that you are a Canadian tax resident. It's also important to understand that you don't want to be a Canadian tax resident because you don't want to pay income tax on worldwide income. As a Canadian tax resident, you're required to report all income from all around the world that you earn. The Canadian Income Tax Act can look at something called residential ties. Um, so what's residential ties? Uh, residential ties include what I mentioned before. Do you have a family in Canada? Do you uh, have a permanent residence in Canada? Do you have your spouse living in Canada? Do you have your children uh, living in Canada as your dependent? So those are the significant residential ties that CLA or the Income Tax Act would look at. On top of the significant residency ties, that we mentioned earlier, um, dependents, uh, permanent residents, uh, spouse or par partner, um, there is some secondary ties that CLA also look at. And these uh, secondary ties include whether you own a car in uh, Canada, whether you have health insurance, whether you are a member of an organization in my situation, I'm a CPA, so I belong to CPA Ontario and CPA Canada, those would be considered secondary ties uh, to tie me back to Canada, so then I would have to pay Canadian tax, that's what it really means. Uh, secondary ties also include your driver license, your health insurance, um, your economic ties, whether you have bank accounts in Canada or not, credit cards in Canada, also um, any, any personal properties that we mentioned. So they would also look at those factors to conclude whether you have strong ties with Canada. And the whole purpose of this ties thing analysis is just to determine whether you will need to pay Canadian taxes on your worldwide income or not. To sever the tie, uh, from Canada, so then the Canadian government do not consider you as a Canadian tax resident. Um, one of the things that you can do um, is that you look at the ties and try to sever it as much as possible. Uh, you shouldn't have a home in Canada because having a home in Canada available for you to use is means that it is a significant tie to Canada and the Canadian government can, can based on that fact alone, could rule that you are required to pay Canadian taxes on worldwide income. 
um, spouse in Canada or kids dependents in Canada. Uh, those are the three factors uh, that you need to pay attention to. On top of that, you can uh, uh, cancel your driver license, you can cancel your uh, membership, professional membership, you can uh, cancel your bank account, do as much as possible within your uh, power to sever the tie. If you have a home in Canada, uh, you have a permanent residence in Canada and you want to keep that place, uh, try to rent out that particular property to demonstrate that there is no per home available for you to come back to in Canada. So then uh, CLA would not uh, use that as a reason to deem you to be a Canadian tax resident. And lastly, it's also very important that you do not stay in Canada for 183 days or more. If you stay in Canada for 183 days or more, then you automatically become a Canadian tax resident as a factual resident because you've been physically here for more than half a year. So then you will automatically become a tax resident. Now that we've covered everything about how to determine whether you are a Canadian tax resident or not, assuming that you've done all your homework, you don't want to become a Canadian tax resident, and remember, the only reason why you don't want to become a Canadian tax resident is because of the Canadian tax, uh, reporting worldwide income on your Canadian tax return. In some situation, you might want to stay as Canadian tax resident because you're not earning any income outside of Canada anyway. Just because you become a Canadian non-tax resident um, doesn't mean that you do not need to pay tax on your Canadian source income. If majority of your income is coming from Canada, then you may as well just become a Canadian tax resident. Assuming that you've done all your analysis, it makes sense to become a non-resident, and you're starting a brand new business, you have lots of em uh, employment, or you have lots of investment outside of Canada, so then you realize that, it's best to sever the tie and become, and become a non Canadian non-tax resident. The first thing that you need to do is to calculate your departure tax and recognize and learn about your ongoing tax filing obligation. So what's departure tax? Well, the departure tax is calculated based on your asset. You may have many different asset categories. You can have had cash, RSP, TFSA, as well as these days, the brand new first time home saving plan account. Uh, you may also have uh, RIF, uh, the retirement saving plan, and you can also have uh, other pension income as well. So those will be one category of uh, assets. You might also have a public company shares traded on the stock exchange in an unregistered account, so not part of your RSP account, just a regular non-registered account. Uh, you might also have other assets such as crypto investment account, your car, your furniture, your painting, uh, all these assets um, are also part of your assets. And then there is also shares of private corporation. If you own a private corporation and you own the shares, that is also part of your assets. You may also own rental properties that is um, in your personal name, then that's part of your asset. And then you might also own your primary residence. These are all the asset categories that you really need to sit down and think about, hey, I have all these. Then there is, then you decide the tax implication on each of them. Actually, the Income Tax Act already decided it for, uh, for you. So we're gonna go through all of these. First thing first, let's talk about high level. Um, Essentially, when you leave Canada, you're required, you are basically disposed all the assets at fair market value at the time you leave Canada. So whether or not you actually sell it doesn't matter, but in the eyes of the Income Tax Act, you're deemed to dispose all these assets at fair market value the day that you leave Canada, except subject to a few exceptions. Now, so that's the general rule. Essentially, this general rule covers everything from your publicly traded shares that uh, you transact on the stock exchange in your non-registered account. This also includes your crypto account. This does also includes shares of your private companies. If you invest in a limited partnership, this also includes your limited partnership as well. So there are ex exceptions. So let's go with the exception first. Uh, exceptions include the personally held real estate properties that you own in Canada. If the properties are not held in Canada, it would still be subject to uh, Canadian departure tax. Uh, property use in business carry on in Canada. So that would be, uh, you don't have to pay capital gain tax or any tax on disposal of these assets, deemed disposal of the assets. Uh, you don't have to pay tax on RSP, RRIF, uh, 
first time home saving account and RESP, RDSP as well. Uh, you also don't need to um, pay tax on your primary residence as well. So those are the properties that you don't need to pay departure tax on, but doesn't mean that there are no other tax implications that we need to go through. Now you need to pay tax on the investment that you held in non-register account, shares of private corporation, the real estate that, that, uh, that you own as Canadian tax resident, but they are located outside of Canada, so you need to pay tax on those, uh, and then also interest in partnership, like I mentioned before. Now, what does that mean by deemed disposition? So let's use an example. The easiest way is to go with an example. Like for publicly traded uh, investment, uh, say you purchase a share, um, let's say TD Bank, you purchase it in a non-registered account and it's worth $20,000. And the day that you become a non-resident, the value of the TD Bank shares now is $25,000. Basically, the day that you, um, uh, you have to pay tax on the increase in price of $5,000 as capital gain. So you have to report that $5,000 as part of your departure tax and report that as capital gain on your last return as a Canadian resi resident. And then obviously you would have to pay tax on, uh, on the $5,000 capital gain that you've accrued, even though you have not actually sell the shares. Now it's time to talk about the Canadian rental properties that you own in your personal name. Now we're only talking about Canadian rental properties, rental properties located in Canada that you own in your personal name. Now you don't have any deemed disposition to uh, that would be triggered, so there is no tax to be paid at the time when you leave Canada per se. But what, what happened is that um, the Canadian government, the Income Tax Act, require non-tax resident, non-resident, to uh, remit to withhold 25% of your gross uh, rent and remit it to the government the 15, by the 15th of the following month as the um, tax withholding amount. So if you, um, you collect rent for $2,000 from your rental property, 25% uh, of that is about $500. You would need to send $500 by the 15th of the following month to CLA on a monthly basis. So let's say uh, you received the money in January um, and you will need to remit that 25% of $2,000 to CLA by February 15th. So it is a very cumbersome and uh, crazy in terms of crazy process for non-resident to own rental properties in Canada. And that could be the reason why nobody actually wants to talk about it on YouTube. Imagine that you have to remit this on a monthly basis, but thankfully they have something called uh, an election, Section 216 election, which would allow a taxpayer who own rental properties in Canada to remit the amount based on the net income, not gross income. So net income means that you collect rent and you subtract your insurance, your property tax, your mortgage interest, uh, or repairs and maintenance or property uh, management fees, all that. The, you only need to remit 25% of your net income with the election. So the key here is to make sure that you get the election and the election has to be approved and there is another form that has to be submitted to CIA on an annual basis on top of the election. So with all that, being submitted, you are then qualified to remit the withholding tax based on the net rental income amount of 25% uh, 25 of that to CLA. And again, unfortunately, the deadline to remit is always the 15th of the following month after you receive the rent. So it is still quite cumbersome. The good news is that majority of the real estate investors out there would be able to use something called capital cost allowance to offset against all their net rental income. So essentially you don't have to pay any, uh, remit any uh, non-residents uh, with withholding tax on the net amount. Um, the filing obligation for people who are receiving rental income as non-resident, there's an ongoing filing obligation and you have to file it on time. Um, is um, an, an annual return similar to the one that you see, the T1 personal tax return that you see uh, on a regular basis, except that it's filed under the, that particular election. And you will report all the income and expenses of the particular property, send that in, submit it to CLA. 
Um, so that would be your ongoing maintenance. Plus, at the beginning of the year, um, actually at the end of every year, you will need to also tell CLA that, hey, I'm doing this election again on an annual basis, and here's my calculation, what I'm expecting in terms of rent, collection, and the net rent, and then we calculate the amount of withholding tax you would have to pay at the end of the year. And that's how um, you decide, how CIA decide whether you would be qualified to uh, use the net withholding tax election. What happens when you want to sell this property uh, that you own personally, the rental property that you own personally. Selling this particular rental property as a non-resident is also a very cumbersome uh, process. Um, you need to obtain something called tax clearance certificate uh, from CLA before the full amount could be released, full proceeds could be uh, released. So uh, as a matter of fact, the buyers are supposed to be the one that is responsible to withhold the taxes if you're a non-resident. So CLA will go after the buyer if you declare that you are a tax resident but you are not a tax resident and they want to go after someone for the money, they probably will go after the buyer. Um, so the amount of tax withholding would be 25% of the gross proceed. If you sell something for a million dollar, CLA want to withhold 25%. Now you're not paying 25%, not the $250,000 as, um, as a tax payable. You're only getting it with whole until you sort out your tax affairs and sort out how much you have to pay CLA and pay that amount, then you will get the 25% withholding release uh, from the lawyer's office. So that's really important uh, to get the tax clearance certificate. And the last time that went through our office, it, went, uh, it took about seven months. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't close the property. It's just that the funds will be sitting in the lawyer's trust all, uh, account for the duration of time until you get the tax clearance certificate from CLA. Now at the end of the year, the last year that you own the rental property, the year of sale, you would still need to file your taxes, uh, showing them there is a sale and reporting the capital gain calculated, reporting the taxes that you pay, also reporting all the rental income and expenses, and then do a final calculation and submit the final tax return to CLA on that particular property. So that is still required. Now, next is about properties that you own inside a Canadian corporation. As I mentioned before, if you own a shares of a Canadian private corporation, there, the deemed disposition rule apply, the departure tax would be imposed on the, uh, when you leave Canada. So what it really means is that, like, let's say you have 10 properties inside a corporation and it's now worth $2 million and net of all the liabilities. And now you, are, you decide to leave Canada. You have to dispose your shares essentially at $2 million. And who would have that money to pay CLA on tax on the sale, deemed disposition of that shares when you haven't sold the properties yet? So an option, um, that's available is that you would be able to put up some um, security, including your properties that you own inside a corporation as collateral to CLA and say, hey, take these and these are your collateral. And you would then be able to use that to um, defer the taxes payable until when you eventually sell the property. So it gets really complicated if you own the properties inside a corporation and you decide to eventually leave Canada. Uh, at the point of disposition, at the point when you leave Canada, it becomes really complicated. And it's a lengthy uh, application process to get CLA to accept the, um, the properties as collateral as well. So cumbersome, lengthy, and painful. Now, after you become a non-resident, you still own this corporation. This corporation is still considered a Canadian corporation, as in filing Canadian corporation taxes. And um, the Canadian corporation taxes, the rule would change ever so slightly because they're rental income property, rental income generating uh, company and you would still need to pay taxes on the sale and everything. When you get the money out of the corporation, the dividend being paid to you uh, personally, there is a 25% tax withholding on the dividend being uh, 
distribute it from the corporation to you because now you're a non-resident. So another 25% withholding to CLA. Yes, there are many hoops that you need to jump through when you own properties within a corporation uh, and you decide to leave Canada altogether. Next topic is RSP, all your registered account. RSP, TFSA, the first time home saving plan, um, the, uh, the RESP, the RDSP, so all these registered account, register account, and also your pension income as well. All these accounts, uh, what happened to all of them? The deemed disposition rule, the departure tax, do not apply to any of these accounts. That's the good news. Um, the only thing is that you might have contribution room that's being carried forward. It might be worthwhile to do one last contribution the year that you are uh, leaving Canada, so then you can lower your departure tax. You could maximize the amount of contribution to your RSP, um, also maximize the contribution to your TFSA. Generally speaking, um, there is no tax implication if you are contributing based on your contribution room available the year that you're leaving. Now, if you leave you decide to leave, you cannot c continue to contribute to any of these accounts. Contribution generally to these accounts are not advised because any over contribution um, would not be uh, would be recognized by CLA and there is a 1% penalty on the amount of contribution over contribution you have to these accounts. So that's not a good idea. So contribution, we cover contribution. Now let's talk about growth in the account on its own. So the reason why we contributed to our RSP or TFSA is because investments within these accounts, any investment income that's generated within these accounts, they are all uh, appreciating. They could all be appreciating on, in a tax shelter basis. So you don't have to pay tax on it, at least not immediately. So the reason why we're doing it is just because the government encouraged us to do some saving. And that is one of the incentive. Now, typically these growth within our investment would not be taxable uh, in Canada. So there is no tax implication. Let's say you have $20,000 sitting in your RSP account and it's generating 10% return annually. So $2,000 annually. That $2,000 would still be sitting in your uh, particular RSP account and it's not you're not going to get taxed on that particular $2,000. Not until the point that you do the withdrawal from the plan. Now, if it is TFSA, it same thing happen. The same $20,000, $2,000 annual return, you're not going to get tax on it. You can do the tax, uh, you can do the withdrawal, you can continue to grow it. There is no, absolutely no tax implication on that $2,000 account, $2,000 annual, um, annual uh, return. However, what we didn't cover is that in your newly adopted home country, they may have different tax rule, they may look at RSP or they may they may look at TFSA differently. So that $2,000 uh, annual growth, annual return that you receive from the TFSA may be taxed in, um, in your new home country. Maybe a ta it may be a taxable event in the, your new home country's tax rule. For example, in the US, they don't recognize TFSA. So any income within your TFSA account that you generate would then be taxable in, on your US tax return. So it gets complicated. So it goes back to your home country, but as for Canadian tax purpose, um, that TFSA income $2,000 not taxable. So these rules also apply similarly across our ESP, our DSP, and also FHSA account as well. When you withdraw money from your RSP, it, typically you will need to report that uh, amount withdrawal as your income. Now in, uh, in the scenario when you become a non-resident, you would also need to withdraw that amount and report that as income. Now, the way that tax is being calculated is that the financial institution that hold your RSP account would take that 25% uh, and send it to CLA first. And then you're really only getting 75%. Let's say you withdraw $10,000, $2,500, they withhold it and send it to the government on your behalf. And you only truly get $7,500. That's how the math works. You might be able to file uh, a return at the end of the year to get some of the 25% that the, uh, 
the banking institution sent to CRA on behalf of you back, you need to file a Section 217 return to possibly get some of that money back. So it's possible, but may not be a lot. Now, what if you have a business? You are either operating as a sole proprietor or in a partnership relationship, or you are operating a corporation shares, uh, operating in a corporation environment, you own your business through a corporation. Um, what if you own a business and what's the tax implication when you decide to leave Canada? Well, unfortunately, the same rule apply. The departure tax would apply whether you own the properties in personal name or in the corporation's name. And you need to do a valuation of your business and then decide whether um, like the actual amount of deemed disposition of the business would be and you pay tax on top of it. And again, you would be eligible to claim possible to um, put up some collateral to defer some of the taxes to be paid. But again, this could be a lengthy, long process that you wouldn't want to uh, engage in. And if you do own a business, and you're planning to leave Canada, it is very important to sit down with someone who knows international tax to help you make the plan accordingly. So when you decide to become a Canadian non-resident, it's important to sit down with the tax professional first before you call the movers, before you book the flight, before you pack the bags. It's important, the most important part is to talk to a Canadian tax advisor that knows departure tax and potentially also know your newly adopted home country's tax a little bit so then you can best map out what has to be done and then devise a plan and maybe it's not important like maybe it's not so important to become a ta non-tax resident because you're not earning any money you're retiring in costa rica per se you're not making any money from costa rica at all maybe it's just fine to stay as canadian tax resident um, maybe it's not maybe you own a lot and you're ma you're having big plans and you're making lots you're planning to make lots of money in your new country then it is important to sit down with someone to design a plan that would work for both of you. It's costly to leave Canada. Think twice before you do that. If you like our video, make sure you give us a thumbs up. And until next time, happy Canadian real estate investing.